Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. You are so welcome today, whether you are in the building or watching online. For those who don't know me, my name's Kyle, and I am the youth pastor, and it's a pleasure that you are here today. Uh, before we start, we've got a great service lined up, but I've got a few announcements. The first one is that masks are still required whilst, well, for the whole of the service, unless we are taking communion. So can I just um, say that masks are still required? If you are in the building, if you're, on, if you're watching online, of course, don't wear a mask in your own house. <laughs> uh, the other announcement is this Friday, the coffee shop is back at 10 a.m. in the coffee lounge, 10 till 12. So we look forward to seeing you there if you can make it. And we're continuing our series of Love God, Love Others. Today we're going to be wrapping it up and I'm going to be sharing with you guys this morning. So why don't we stand and worship God and I'll pray and then I'll hand over to the worship band. So let's stand. Yeah, God, we just thank you that we are able to gather as one community who want to serve you and know you more. I pray that we will just experience your love today that lives will be transformed, that people will be empowered to go live a life worthy of the calling that you have given them. So I pray, God, for a great time and that you will move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
guys have a great time. God, we pray for uh, our children, our young people and our leaders that uh, you would bless them this time.
comes to share with us. That you would speak to us through your servant. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you guys for that incredible worship. It's awesome that we can worship God even with masks on, isn't it? But yeah, I'm going to be kicking, well, finishing the series today of love God and love others. And obviously, sadly, well, it's not really sad. It's a bit of a, it's good and bad. And obviously, I don't get to hear much of the messages live because we're out with the live wires guys now. So I've been able to watch them back on YouTube and there's an awesome that we're able to record these. So if you haven't been following the series over the last few weeks, we've been talking about loving God and loving others. And way before I even started here, there was banners on the wall that said to love God and love others. So obviously as a church, you want to look at what that means if that's on your wall, whether there's new people coming in or old people coming in. They're going to be thinking, does this church love God and love others? Do we do that well? And that's why we're doing the series, looking at what it means to love God and to love others as church, as people, as Christians, as friends, as families. What does that look like for you? What does that look like for me? Do we really love God and love people? Do we really? The truth is, I can't see how well you love God. I can't. I don't get to spend much time with you. You know, even if I'm really close with you, I don't get to see every hour of every day that you live in your life. I don't really get to see if you love God and love him well. But there's a few verses in the Bible that talk about how people can see whether we love God. And Jesus is talking to his disciples in chapter 13 of John, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And Jesus gives a new commandment to the disciples and to the people listening. And he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then it says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So how do we know if people love God? By the way, we love people. You see, to love God is to love people. And sometimes I think we can really do loving God really well, or it can look like we love God really well. We read our Bible, our devotion time's incredible, we're at church every Sunday. We love God. But then we neglect the people that God has created. And I think, as Christians sometimes, everyone can fall short of the standard of loving all people. And, you know, I've only been in church really the last four or five years now in terms of church as a body. And I knew that not every Christian loved every other Christian because we fail and we fall short. But I think it wasn't really until I became a youth pastor that I really found out that some Christians can be really horrible. <laughs> and, I, and I think as well, like, sometimes I can be really horrible as well as a Christian. And... Yeah, maybe it took me for, to, to sort of see the church from a different perspective rather than always being on there. I, I, was, I was a youth pastor and, and I was seeing different things and I was reading different things and I was seeing that, oh, maybe not everyone loves everyone. And I'm sure you guys can agree with me. I don't think I'm, I'm preaching here and people are going, what's he on about? Everyone loves everyone here. Or every Christian loves every Christian, no matter what they've done, no matter what they've done to me. Of course, every Christian loves every Christian. I'm sure we know that's not true. But how sad is that to God that that's not true? What does God think of that, that we don't love every single person? That God created him, created them in the image of him. Every single person here, whether you were in the building or watching online, God created you in the image of him. So it's easy to love God love God. It's easy to look like we love God in our devotion time, church, worship in the sky with our hands up in the air. It's easy to look like we're Christians, but how do we really love people? 
You see, I was, as I was preparing, I felt like God was prompting me to ask a question of myself, but also to ask you a question of, if I was to ask your friends to describe you, what would they say? What would they say about you? Not your Christian friends, because the Christian friends see you with your hands in the sky, looking like you know the Bible, praying to God. What do your friends that don't know Jesus say about you? What would they, what would they describe you like? And I had a great conversation a few days ago about wearing like Christian clothing. Like I love to wear Christian clothing that sort of shows people that I follow Jesus. But I felt a bit of conviction in that conversation. That does wearing this really show that I love Jesus? Because Kanye West made an album or, or sort of has this brand called God's Plan. And there's loads of clothing that says God's Plan. And many people that are not Christians wear God's Plan. Does that make them a Christian because they wear clothing? Absolutely not. So how do people know if we follow Jesus? By the way, we, we love others. So we're going to look at that over the next few minutes, if that's okay with you guys, as we, as we wrap up the series of loving God and loving others. What does it look like to really love others? What does it look like to love me? A person who falls short, a person who... Doesn't, doesn't always do their best, doesn't always give 100% to some things. What does it look like to love me? What does it look like for me to love you? What does it look like for you guys to love the people around you right now in this moment as a church, but also wider than that? What does it look like for us to love people on a Sunday morning? What does it look like for us to love people on a Tuesday in life groups? What does it look like for us to love people in a church members meeting? What does that look like? I wonder if there's any conviction right now or God stirring something for us to change, for us to be different, for me to be different, to love people more, to love people well. I wonder if there's a stirring right now that maybe there needs to be some repentance, not just as, as individuals, but maybe as a church. Maybe sometimes we've done stuff wrong and we've let people down. And when I say maybe, I know we have because we're people and we fail. I want to unpack a few verses in Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14. If, if you want to get your Bibles, I will read them for you guys as well. And, and as uh, some of the younger men slash older men in, in the church really have been reading Colossians together, sort of reading half a chapter a day, and we get to see what people are reflecting on in Colossians 3. And as I read a few days ago these verses, I was really struck by what God was saying, as I knew I was preparing on, on love love others. So I'm going to read from verse 12 to verse 14. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I want to be a part of a church that does that, that clothes themselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, gentleness, patience. But over all of that, covers us with love, love for people, love for God. I want to be a part of that church. I want us to be a church that does that and does that well. Because we come to church because we love God or, or, or we come to church because maybe we're exploring. But what, what I'm trying to say is that we come to church to love God, but also for community. And it's important that we do community well with people. How do new people feel when they walk through the doors? And I'm sure there might be some new people here today or some people who have been coming here for a few weeks. How do you feel when, they walk through, when you've walked through the doors? Do we do this stuff well? Do we love people well is the question that I'm asking. Yes, it's challenging. And I'm not saying in this message you're going to go home um, while you're eating your dinner. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm really loved up. I'm feeling really like, you know, some of the messages that just give you that. Oh, that's a nice one. I'm not expecting it to be that today. Because I believe God's got a message and he wants to speak to all of us, including myself. That to love others is hard. But to love others is to love God. 
You see, all the, all the things that are described in Colossians 3 are needed for a good relationship. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. If you want to have a good relationship, those things are needed. A romantic relationship, yes, those things are needed. A friendship, yes, those things are needed. A family friendship or relationship, yes, those things are needed. Whatever the relationship, those things are needed. But you know what's more important than all those things? Those things that bring them all together and is love. Love for people. And in these few verses it says, forgive one another as Jesus forgave you. (laughs) Forgive one another as Jesus forgave you. Now I don't know everyone's story here and you certainly don't know every part of my story because if you did, you'd probably look at me very differently. Not even friends, not even family know all of, the, all of my story because there's some things you just, maybe you don't want to share or, or there's just sometimes you, you feel like you don't need to share that. But Jesus forgave me of all of them things. I wonder if you knew everything about me, would you forgive me of everything that I've ever done in my life? I wonder. I wonder if I heard some stuff about you, would I forgive you for every single thing you've done in your life? And sometimes when people hurt us, it can be personal or it feels personal. And those are usually the hardest times where we need to forgive people. But us turning our back away from God was personal. To God, it was personal. Because he said, here I am, that I love you so much that I died on a cross for you, that you were created in my image, yet you turned your back on me. But what happens when we come back to him? What does he do? Oh yeah, he forgives us. And then we might do it again. And what happens again? Oh yeah, he forgives us. So to forgive people like Jesus forgave us, it's not just this small forgiveness. It's a lot more than that. Let me tell you guys today, this this forgiveness that Jesus did for us is a lot more. It goes, you did this to me. Okay, I apologize. Yeah, I forgive you. That person does that again. Okay, a bit harder to take, but I forgive you. That person does that again and again and again. And as people, that's happened with Jesus, the times that we turn away. And what does Jesus do? Oh, I'll forgive them. I'll forgive them. I'll forgive them. Time after time after time. So when Jesus says, forgive people like I forgive you, that's a lot more than just accepting forgiveness once or twice or three times or four times. God forgives people even knowing full well that they may do that very thing again. I wonder in your life if there's been times where you've not forgiven someone because you knew that they were going to do it again. Because that's their personality. That's who they are. Of course they're going to do that again. But I'm sure Jesus knew that we were going to do that again. That we were going to let him down time after time after time. But what does he say? Forgive people like I have forgiven you. And if you take anything away from today, remember that. That Jesus wants us to forgive like he forgave us. And please, don't get me wrong, but I'm not standing here saying, I've got this all together. You see, when we preach, we're not standing on and going, I've got this all together. We're opening up the word of God and going, this is what the Bible says. This is what Jesus says. And I'm just a messenger. A proud one. It's a privilege to do this. But don't think that I've got this all together because I certainly haven't asked my friends, asked my family. I haven't got this stuff together. But what I'm saying is Jesus says it in his word. And if you're a Christian, you want to follow this. You want to follow the Bible. You see, we, we talk about commandments and, 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 and sometimes non-Christians will say, oh, the Bible is just a book of, of rules and, law, and laws. And there's a lot of laws in the Old Testament for sure. You know, if you, want to, if you want to read that, there's a lot of them. But it's about having a relationship with Jesus. The very fact that the most, the, or, the, or the, the top commandment that Jesus gives is to love him. But the one right below that is to love others. And I believe if you love others, 
You can do a very good job then in loving God. But if you just love God and not people, we're going against what, what Jesus says. We're going against his commandments. I wonder what it would look like if we forgave someone without conditions, saying, yeah, I forgive you, but if you ever do that again to me, I will never speak to you again. How many times have we say that? I have. You do that again, I'll never speak to you. Or you do that again, I, will, I won't forgive you this time. How many times do we say that? Oh, what would happen if Jesus said that to us? Where would we be? Yeah, I forgive you this one time. Do you know sometimes when we pray and we go, right, I'm so, God, I'm so sorry I've done this. I keep on falling into this. God, please forgive me for this. I won't do it again. I promise I won't do it again. God, I promise I won't do this again. And what happens next week? We do it again. And we do it again. And we do it again. And we do it again. Because the truth is we're people and we fail. But Jesus says to forgive people like he forgave us. And there was no conditions on the forgiveness Jesus forgave us with. So I wonder, in this moment, is he thinking that we should forgive people without conditions too? I wonder. I just wonder what the world would look like if we were to do that. I wonder what this church would look like. I wonder what our life groups would look like, our Sunday morning services, our youth groups. What would they look like? What would our church members' meetings look like? What would our prayer meetings look like? What would, what would our community projects look like? What would our kids' work look like? What would our coffee morning shops look like? What would our church look like if we were to do that, I wonder? You know, Charles Spurgeon says about forgiveness, suppose that someone had grievously offended any of you. Oh, we've all been offended before. Of course we have. And we're in a culture right now that is easily to offend someone. I'm sure we know that. So this is very relatable. Suppose that someone has, had grievously offended any one of you and that he asked your forgiveness. Do you think that you would probably say to him, well, yes, I forgive you, but I can't forget it. Ah, dear friends, that is a sort of forgiveness with one leg chopped off. It is lame forgiveness and not worth much. And he's talking about holding grudges here. And I wonder if we've, we've sort of said, yeah, we forgive someone but we're still holding a grudge. And I, I'm 99% sure that there's people in this room that hold a grudge over someone else in this room. With the amount of people in here, the chances are high. And I'm sure since I've been youth pastor, I've upset a few people. Of course I have, because I'm a person and I fail. But I wonder when we ask for forgiveness, or someone asks us for forgiveness, how do we respond? Yeah, I forgive you but I can't forget. Or when you were younger and you punch your sister. Yeah? Okay, maybe none of you did that. <laughs> no, I know none of you did that. Maybe when you've been arguing with your siblings and my sister's bit me on the back, which she actually did do. <laughs> and I'm crying. And then my mum says that Taya has to say sorry. But that sorry's not sincere, is it? Of, co of, of course it's not sincere that... She's only saying sorry because someone else tells her. Obviously, I forgave her now. <laughs> but sometimes with time comes forgiveness as well. Sometimes we need that time to just reflect. And then in the future, we are ready to forgive. Let's be real about forgiveness. Let's just not just say, oh, yeah, I forgive you. Because like, it feels like the right thing to do. Let's be genuine. Let's be meaningful. But the most important thing is what God calls us to do. The most important thing in your life is what God calls you to do. As you're calling, as, as what he has physically called you to do, as in, obviously I feel right now, God has called me to be a youth pastor. And what an incredible privilege it is. But I know God has called people to be firefighters, to be teachers, to be school workers, to be stay-at-home mums for now. But I know God has called people to do something, but... Over all of that, God calls us to love. And in that, in loving people, it means to forgive. And if you don't think that, then I'm not sure how many people you have loved. Because how many times 
of, of our loved ones, as in maybe family, friends, or even romantic relationships, how many pe- times have they let us down? Oh, I could write a list about how many times I've let people down. But what does God call us to do when people let us down? To forgive. You see, I believe love breaks unforgiveness. I'm going to say that again. Love breaks unforgiveness. You see, I'm quite sure as well people here today will be battling unforgiveness when people have done stuff to us. Of course we have. You know, I can th- well, as I'm saying this, I can think of times right now where I'm battling unforgiveness. But what breaks that, I believe, is love. And I think that is portrayed many times in the Old Testament where someone has upset someone else But the only reason that they come back into community, the only reason that they are forgiven is because of the love that they have for one another. There's a story in Genesis 27. And over life groups over the last few weeks with the youth, we've been looking at forgiveness or unforgiveness. And we titled it Fighting Forgiveness because it's not always easy to forgive. But this story, Genesis 27, Jacob and Esau. And I'll give you guys a quick overview of what's going on. Esau's the oldest son, and he is extremely hairy, and it is important you know that. And also, he smells a bit as well. Um, and Jacob is the younger son, quite clean, smells very nice. And what happens is their dad is on deathbed, and he is going to bless the older son. He's going to bless Esau because he gets the birthright, he gets the blessing. A few other things have happened in the story. I'm just trying to give you a quick overview. But what happens is... Jacob tries to dress up as Esau and puts all like wool on his, on his arms and all over his body and puts on Esau's clothes to make him smell to try and deceive the dad because he wants the blessing of his dad. And I'm sure most of you guys have heard the story. His dad is blind, so he doesn't really know. He can't see. That's, that's obviously what blind is. Um, but basically what happens is Jacob steals the blessing of Esau. And read that story in Genesis 27 and and the next few chapters after that um, to really unpack that. But basically what happens is Jacob steals something off off Esau. It's as simple as that. Something that Esau deserved and was rightfully his because he was the oldest son. And it was just like that in the olden days. And what happens is Jacob and Esau don't see each other for a few years. But when they do, something incredible happens. And it's found in Genesis Chapter 33 and verses 1 to 4. And it says, Jacob looked up and there was Esau. They haven't seen each other for a few years, mind. So, you know, Jacob can think there's a bit of bad blood going on. You know, he's going to kill me. He stole something off me. And then Jacob ran away. And now the first time they see each other, he's going to take my head off. And it says, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. Oh no, we're in trouble. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. And this is is incredible. Verse 4 says, But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they wept. You see, Jacob and Esau fell out, and we fall out with people. But how do we respond? You see, the thing that brought Esau and Jacob back together was their love for one another. That Esau couldn't really hold a grudge over his brother. Why? Because love breaks unforgiveness. The love we have in us breaks unforgiveness. If we love people, we should want to forgive them, and I believe we will want to forgive them. But also sometimes... And this story shows that, that we need time to heal. Because it took a few years for Jacob and Esau to rekindle, to sort of come back together in one relationship. Sometimes we need that time away from that person. But the power of love breaks unforgiveness. If there's a question you're asking me guys today, as we look at forgiveness, is how to forgive someone. My simple answer would be to love them. And it might even mean that you love them before you forgive them. But I know when you love someone, you want to forgive them. Even when sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Maybe over time you need need that space to recover, to heal. 
The only reason Esau forgave his brother was because he loved him. You know, Jacob hadn't said sorry or anything because they'd only just seen each other. But straight away when they saw each other, they embraced each other and they wept. You see, what I want to say to you guys today is don't allow unforgiveness to rob you of love because that's what I believe it does. Don't allow unforgiveness to rob you of the love from someone else. Don't allow unforgiveness to rot inside you. Don't allow it to internally mess you up because that's what unforgiveness can do. They can rot you internally. And maybe we're feeling a bit uncomfortable right now because we know that there's someone that we need to forgive. And the reality is there probably is. For me, for you guys, that there might even be someone here that we need to forgive. But love can break that. Love can break, break that feeling of feeling unforgiven. But, and there's a but moment, I understand as people we will fail. And I understand as people we have failed. I'm not saying that we're, we're perfect at doing this. I'm certainly not perfect at, at loving people and forgiving people any time that they have done wrong. However, love breaking unforgiveness was modeled by a faultless person. And as I come to an end and I ask the band to prepare to be ready. You see, Jesus came. The fact that Jesus came showed how much he loved us. You see, for us to be forgiven in God's eyes for the things that we have done wrong, something needed to happen. If you've read the Bible before, you will see throughout the Old Testament, people fail. So they kill an animal and sacrifice it as showing that, that a, a sacrifice to God, asking for their forgiveness. And it would be done like that all the time, all the time, until it got to a point where just people failed so much. <laughs> I wonder if you failed so much. Oh, I wonder if you feel like that today, that you've, that you've failed so much, that God can't love me. Why are we talking about love God and love people? I can't even love myself. How can we talk about this? How can I love other people if I don't even love myself? But I know a person that I'm, I'm a billion percent positive loves you right now in this moment. Even if you feel like the people you're sitting next to don't, or, or you feel like you know no one who loves you. I know a person that does, and his name is Jesus. But love entered into the world when Jesus came. True love. Love like no other. You see, God so loved the world so much that he sent his son to break unforgiveness. The reason that Jesus came is so that we could be forgiven. That's the reason. So that we could have a relationship with him. Jesus' love broke it. His love for me, his love for me broke it. His love for you broke it. Broke unforgiveness so that we could be forgiven. And over everything that I've said today, this is what it comes back to. Loving others is vital as people who love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you need to love people. And if you love people, that means you have to forgive a few people. Because that's what love is, forgiveness. And if Jesus didn't give that to me today, I wouldn't be here. If Jesus didn't offer that to you today, you might not be here. You'd be somewhere else. But he did. And he told us to forgive people like he forgave us. But if you take nothing else from this today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I wanna, just want to speak to you guys for a minute. Or maybe you, you're battling, you're, you're exploring. We all like to explore to see if this is real. And it's good that you do that, that you, that you want to see if all this is right. If Jesus really did die on a cross. If, people, if Christians do really love God, if when you meet Jesus, your life is actually changed, there's got to be a change when you know Jesus. I believe when you meet him, your life will be radically transformed. But the forgiveness I want you to remember today, if you don't know him, 
is the one that Jesus offers you because of nothing else, not because of anything you've done, not because of the way you look or the way you've acted. You think you're a good person, you're not. The reason that Jesus offers that today is because of his love for you, nothing else. God loves you. And I pray today as a church that from this moment that we will be changed, that our love for God will shine through in our love for people. But I wanna give people an opportunity here to respond. And I believe forgiving people doesn't need to be done in front of everyone. You can do that, you know, you know what you need to do and I'm gonna let you guys go away and do that. But what I wanna do is give people an opportunity to respond to the forgiveness that Jesus offers because that's the most important thing spending a lifetime with a God who loves us so much. What an incredible privilege that is. So why don't we close our eyes? I'm just gonna say a simple prayer. And if you wanna become a follower of Jesus, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. I want you to say, the prayer that I'm saying. And if you are a Christian as well, say that prayer, remember what he did for you. You could say a salvation prayer every week to remember that a God that loves us so much wants a relationship with us. So when I pray. Yeah, Jesus, I thank you that you loved us, that you loved me that your love broke unforgiveness. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want a relationship with you. I want to know you. Thank you for taking away all the bad things that I have done and giving me new life. Amen. Stand together. Your grace is enough more than I need at your word.
as a church to remember the fact that Jesus died on a cross for us and obviously we've been doing it a bit different lately because we've, we've got COVID um, so I'm going to read some verses and how it's going to work is I'm going to give you ch- guys a chance to reflect and then I'll pray um, and then you can open your communion But this is a really precious thing that we're able to do this. Don't just do this because everyone else is doing it. And I'm going to read some verses and give us a chance to reflect on that. So 1 Corinthians, verses 23 onwards. And it says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But I'm going to go further. Because it says, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And I read that because that's what the Bible says. I don't read it because it's what I've said, but I read it to show that this is important, that we don't just do this to tick a box once a month, but we do it to remember a God that died on a cross. So I'm just gonna give us a chance to reflect on those verses. Maybe we need to do something. Maybe we need to pray to God. But I'm gonna give you a chance to do that. And then I'll pray. So yeah, God, we thank you for what you did. That you dying on the cross was final, it was done. That the battle was won. That death could become life. So that you could be triumphant. So that we could know you, despite the things that we've done. That you forgive us with no conditions. So Jesus, we honor you in doing this. Amen.
What an honor it is that we serve a God that loves us so much, that he calls us mine, chosen. We are loved. And there's nothing that we could do for that love to go. So I pray as a church, to our best abilities we will do that, that we will love people like God loves us. We will try and we will forgive people like Jesus forgave us. Amen. So I'm gonna hand over to the band for one last song. But thank you for joining us, guys. It's been a great time to be able to worship God. And I pray that you spoke to you today, that you will pray, that you will have just gone from this place being different, being transformed, being made new because you've experienced his love. I don't know, I feel just really like drawn to change what we were going to end the service with today. I'm going to go back to the start. Um, the song we opened with, um, More Than Conquerors, because I think, um, yeah, I don't know, I just feel like there's a, there's a, there's a calling today, a, a, a thing to go out, and a, just a, a remembrance of that strength that we have in Christ. Um, that, you know, when we feel like we can't do anything else, actually through him, uh, we have the promise that we're more than conquerors. So let's, uh, let's stand together. Um, those of you at home, do whatever you, you, you would normally do. But, you know, just let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go out. Let's, uh, let's just enjoy the presence of God today um, and, and uh, as we go on from here.
help us to remember that, God, this week in our in our quest to love you, to love others more, God, that, uh, yeah, through you all things are possible. Yeah, as we go from here, God, that you would use us to bless others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, see you next time.